I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 85 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 085. Well, folks, I ended up over the, over the, well, since the last episode, I have ended up making a purchase or three in the gun and gun supplies category. One of the items that I am pretty excited about, and actually I've picked up some reloading supplies, reloading equipment, and some firearms, but the item I am most excited about is an STI Lawman 5.0. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm bringing back the I want to, since I got a new gun, I'm going to bring back the gun of the show to discuss it. Now, the STI Lawman 5.0 is, uh, I mean, they actually call it the Lawman 5.0. That's the model. Uh, it's chambered in 45 auto or 45 ACP. Capacity is 7 plus 1. Like all 1911 pattern pistols, it's a single action. The rear sight is adjustable, although there are no dots, no tritium insert, no coloration. It's just a black rear sight with a black front sight. The front sight is uh, drift adjustable, although you, they do not recommend it, or I don't recommend it. They may, but I don't. You get an adjustable rear sight, adjust it. Now materials, it's made with a forged steel frame, like all current STI firearms. It has a carbon steel slide. It weighs in at around 42 ounces, and MSRP is $1,499. Now, I did pay a little bit less than that, counting taxes. And for those of you who don't know, here in Texas, sales tax is expensive. But we, don't have a, uh, we do not have a state income tax, so eh, I'll take, the, I'll take the sales tax. Now, let me tell you a little bit about why I bought the STI Lawman. I've always wanted an STI, and the Lawman is the gun that really held my interest. Well, I went to, uh, I went to Midland. And my goal was to purchase another item, but we'll cover that later in another episode, most likely. And I went to Midland, and I got that item. I decided, you know what, I want to drop in at the range. So I take the pistol I've got with me. I go to the range. I shoot it. And then when I'm getting ready to leave, I see, I see, you know, some of the guns on the counter. I decide, you know what, or some of the guns in the display counter. You know what, I'm going to stick around and look at these just briefly before I go home. And I walk past the Glocks. I mean, I got a Glock. I don't really feel anything for it. But when you get right down to it, in 10 millimeter, the Glock Model 20 is probably the best firearm for the money. But I'm looking at the firearms. I'm checking them out. And in the left, as you're coming in the door, the left rear corner of the store, there's this STI or well, there's this case that has a number of 1911s, including the STI guns that they had in stock. And I go and I check it out. Sitting there is a lawman, and it's got a and it's got a fairly nice price. Needless to say, I pretty much had to make a purchase. Now I didn't have any 45 auto with. Well, actually, now that I think about it, I did, but I didn't have time to shoot it, so I didn't shoot it there. I don't think I realized I had the 45 auto ammo with me anyway. But I had the I had the firearm, I had the ammo, and why not? right? Anyhow, I get the weapon back to where I need it. I get the, I get everything where I'm happy. Now it's time to make things go. Well, I clean the gun. I give it a good dry lube. And then me and my friend Ray from the Pro Gun Podcast, which we really are wanting to get that thing going again. It's just our schedules do not seem to mesh up very well for recording an episode. We get everything going. We make it to the range. And we really start tearing stuff up at the range. Unfortunately, I do not like the grips that are on this gun. I have a solution. I'll discuss that later in the show. Because I want to I want to get through this segment and move on to the next. But what I really want to touch on is grips make a gun. And the grips that come on this STI just do not work for me. I mean, they're beautiful grips. But when it comes to how they feel, let's just say that there's a very good chance that I will... Oh, I can't destroy a pair of grips. I want to say there's a very good chance I'll destroy them, but I can't. I can't bring myself to do that. In all truth, I will take these grips, and I will uh, I will perform a maintenance cycle, and these grips will be, when I do this maintenance cycle on the STI, these grips will be removed, the new grips will be put on, and these grips will be stored. I won't sell them because I have this, I have this addiction. You see, 
When it comes to firearms grips, I have a hard time saying no. In fact, a number of the firearms I've purchased it has been because I like the grips that were on them when I got them. I'm not saying all of them. I'm not saying the majority even, but a number of them. Anyhow, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. We'll come back, and after we come back, I'll touch on some listener email, and then we'll go from there. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, we got that done, and we do have a bit of listener feedback. Ron emailed in asking, how do we best normalize open carry? Ron, the answer is complex enough that it requires its own show topic, and I hate to tell you this, but it's it's going to be it's going to be something that a lot of people are going to say, well, we need to do more, and we need to do more now. No, we need to acclimate people to it. You don't take a freshwater fish and throw it in a saltwater tank. You don't take a saltwater fish and throw it in a freshwater tank. You gradually acclimate them to the you gradually get them acclimated to the tank that you're wanting them to be in. If you just throw them in there, even if there's a, just a temperature gradient, if you just throw them in a different tank, you're likely to kill your fish. Well, I'm going to actually dedicate this the topic on this range, or why am I, I don't know why I said range. I'm a little distracted here. The firearm I have on my desk for this episode is the STI Lawman, because I want to talk about it and what I plan to do in a moment. However, the topic I'm going to use for this show is going to be how we normalize open carry. I really feel that this is something that needs to be addressed. But before we move on to the topic of the show, man, I want to go to the range. Just looking at this gun makes me want to go to the range. But I got to explain some things before we do. Before we go on to the topic of the show, let me tell you why I'm wanting to go to the range. You see, those who listened to the Pro Gun podcast a while back noticed that we did an episode that, well, we torture tested my Kimber 1911. Thousand rounds, no cleaning, no maintenance. Me and Ray, while we were at, well, it was after we were at the range, but we started thinking about it before the range trip, or while we were at the range, we started thinking about it. However, we kind of, we kind of came up with this really, really wicked idea. We decided we were going to try another thousand round ch- challenge on a firearm, and what better to do it to than an STI lawman? I mean, this gun is fitted super tight, and we'll give you a review of the gun later, or I will. We're going to do a 1,000-round test on this gun, and this is how we're going to do it. The ammunition is going to be mixed factory and reloads. I have some Winchester white box. I I want to say I have two boxes of 200 of that. I want to build up some reloads using Rainier 230-grain plated bullets. I have about 1,000 bullets of those coming in now. I have about 400 uh, Hornady 230 grain two full metal jacket bullets, and I'm going to throw some of those in on it. And going all the way back to our thousand round challenge on the Kimber TLE2, I happen to have a box of Spear Lawman that has 20 rounds remaining. I feel it's only fitting that since this box was used in that thousand round challenge, that it be used in this one too. And this one, we're going to use it as our base ammo. You see, or not our base, but our baseline. We are going to... I'm trying to think of the best way to describe what I'm wanting to do here. We're going to take and... We're going to put rounds across the chronograph, and then we're going to uh, really kick the test off. When we're done, we're going to put some more rounds across the chronograph, and we're going to compare the results. We're going to find out... And I'll have some reloads that are loaded rather precisely as well on our chronograph shots. But our goal will be... To determine if these loads or if the gun loses or gains performance based on this test. Now, with the ammunition out of the way, we're not going to take the gun apart. We're not going to clean it. We're not going to lube it during the test. Should there be a failure, it will be documented and reported, and we will proceed with the test from there. If the gun fails and it has to be dismantled, the test is over. The gun failed. The goal of the test in all honesty, is to see if a brand new with less than 50 rounds fired through a STI 
can run a thousand rounds without failures other than operator induced failures. Now, as I said before, me and Ray did this to a well broken in Kimber TLE2 a few years ago. And the only failure that gun experienced was an operator induced error. And that was induced by someone we allowed to shoot the gun while we were at the range. They limp wristed it and the gun failed. Just about any firearm will fail if you limp wrist it. Now, the gear for this test obviously will start with the STI Lawman except for its grips. In place of the factory grips, I'm gonna throw on a pair of Crimson Trace LG401G laser grips. In fact, those should be um, those should be delivered today. I have an app on my phone, I'm gonna check and see. US Postal Service shows they're out for delivery, and I'm having them delivered to where I work because I didn't know if they were gonna come in while I was off work or while I was at work or what, so they're out for delivery. And the thing about the LG 401G laser grips, they're for a full-size 1911, and they have a green laser. Now, the gun itself is factory new. It's We've test-fired it, and we fired around 30 rounds. I cleaned it. I lubed it. The gun's ready for the test, except for the grips. And we are going to use the exact same cleaning and lube, as well as the same exact uh, methods, or the same exact cleaner and lube, as well as the same exact materials and methods. Black. Why do I, why am I doing that? Oh, well. I will clean and lube it using the exact same materials and methods as the Kimber TLE2 when we tested it. And I do actually have a little bit of the same exact cleaner and lube. The thing about this is I buy in bulk. And it takes me a few years to go through some of my reserves. I'm feeling pretty good about that, though. Now, as far as magazines go, because the vast majority of 1911 or any semi-auto failures are magazine-related, I'm going to use the same magazines that I used when we tested the Kimber. This means the Kimber mags are fair game, the metal form mags are fair game, and the Checkmate magazines are fair game, as well as the, since it came with the gun, we're going to use the STI factory magazine as well. And I may holler at my buddy Ray. He's got, uh, he's got a Kimber mag that he purchased for a, I'm trying to remember, Rock Island Armory full size. We may include that one since it's the same as the others, but we may not. We may just use my magazines. In fact, I think we will. So we have four different magazines or four different brands of magazine here. We have one of one brand, one or two of another, and an assortment of the others. Overall, I think we're going to, I think we're going to have some results, some nice results. Hey, you know what? I've rambled on about this long enough. Let me hit the audio clip that tells you how to get or how to find the show on social media and then we'll come back and we'll actually talk about the topic which is normalizing open carry the gun rights in texas podcast has a social media presence you can like it on facebook you can follow it on twitter you can circle it on google plus and you can follow it on instagram with all those options let's get social Alrighty, let me kick this off. I'm I'm going to be honest. I practice what I preach. And when I went to Midland and ended up buying the STI, I open carried. I was going to a place that sold guns and gun-related supplies. I then went to a range that I'd never been to before. Although a friend of mine called me and asked me where I was at and in relation to the range. It's almost like he knew I would be there or that I would, he, he knew I'd know where a range was. And I'll be honest, before I bought the, before I went to that range, I did not know it was there. It's kind of a, kind of dis- of a discovery that made me very happy. Let me tell you a little bit about this range. This is the Midland Indoor Gun Range. It's, uh, I believe it's called the Family Armory and Indoor Range. When I was there, there were two gentlemen and two ladies working. All of them were open carrying. Very nice facility. Their roles are, their roles are situated around safety. And I don't blame them. Safety is always good. And overall, I have to say that it's a very pleasant range to shoot at. If you're in the middle of Odessa area and you want to shoot at an indoor range, I cannot recommend them enough. And with that said, it's been three and a half months since open carry became legal in Texas. And for the most part, nothing has happened other than some folks are now exercising their option to carry in a shoulder or belt holster. There have been no open carry shootings in, uh, at a car accident. There has been no blood in the streets. No license holders killed because police confused them with a criminal. No license holders 
have really been harassed for ID by every law enforcement officer they meet. There have been no cases of bad guys shooting open carriers first. In fact, none of the doom and gloom predicted by the opponents of HB 910 on either side have come true. We have seen one request that I'm aware of that relates to open carry, and that was by a man known to seek out encounters with law enforcement. Well, this gentleman, he has a history of getting arrested. He's a political activist, and he thinks if you're not getting arrested, or he gives me the impression that he thinks if you're not getting arrested, you're not being politically active enough. Now, this would be Brett Sanders. Essentially, Brett Sanders was standing off the pavement on the side of an interstate. I believe it's an interstate. It might have been the highway. Between the highway and the access road, the pavement on the side of the inner, or ah, what I was, I got an outline and I started reading the line above it. But anyways, he was standing off the pavement in the grass between the highway and the median. He was holding up a sign, something about speed trap ahead or something like that. He was approached by an officer. The officer said it was illegal to be in that area of the highway at, if you're not somehow dealing with your vehicle or something. And then he asked Sanders for ID. Sanders refused and was arrested. The thing is, Sanders was open carrying at the time. Now, everybody's saying this is a case of he was arrested for failing to ID when he was open carrying. And that's like saying, uh, well, that's like saying my Jeep's dirty because West Texas is windy. It wouldn't matter if West Texas was windy or not. My Jeep would still be dirty. He was arrested for failing or for refusing to show ID. The officer will, if this goes to court, the officer will probably be able to make a case that, yeah, he had a right to demand ID in this situation because he honestly believed that Sanders was breaking the law. And I'm told that uh, people are having a hard time determining if what Texas has as a law was actually in viol- was being violated by Sanders, but... You know, it's one of those things that, well, you don't, you don't really want this being a case that's used to set precedent because it will most likely set us a bad precedent in legal opinions. And I do also want to say that additionally, behavior like this will only serve to hurt our long-term goals by giving our opponents ammunition to support any existing restrictions that we try to repeal or even new ones that they try to push. Now, the reason I bring up the arrest of Brett Sanders is because it's it's a case of how you do not normalize open carry. The trick to normalizing open carry is to open carry while doing mundane things that do not really draw attention to yourself. Initially, you want to open carry while doing things like pumping gas or walking the dog or little minor things like that. I mean, if you're out mowing your lawn, you could open carry before, but right now it'd be a great thing to do as long as you know your neighbors aren't going to, hey, he's got a gun. I want to break in his house and steal it. As long as you know your neighbors and you can trust them, when you're mowing the lawn, do it. When you're carrying out the trash, do it. Anytime you're doing something insanely boring and mundane and you want to normalize open carry, open carry. Anything that you can do and people will not bat an eye at you is a good thing to open carry when you're doing it. Because when people are, when people see you, they still notice you. They may not bat an eye at you. They may not look at you a second time. But you're just going about your business. You're doing something that's everyday normal. In the back of their brain, they they catalog, he has a gun. And they see this enough, and suddenly, and I do mean suddenly, their brain switches modes. Their brain goes from, he's got a gun, I need to keep an eye on him, I need to leave this area, guns are bad, to their brain switches modes. Well, so he's got a gun. So what? I see people with guns all the time. Nothing bad ever happens. Click. Their brain is now in guns are not a threat unless somebody's handling them mode. And this is what we want. Until people are used to open carrying, let's talk about a few things you want to avoid open carrying while you're doing or when you're around. Okay? Try to avoid open carrying around crowds, around schools, at least until people get used to open carry in general. Now you also, as an extension of this, you want to avoid open carrying around parks, playgrounds, and youth centers as well. The reason is People will classify you as a threat and they will develop those negative emotions, which means negative feelings, which means negative opinions about open carry if you're in, around a school, a park, a playground, or a youth center. And what you do is you avoid these areas, be, not because it's a bad place to open carry, but because it will generate bad emotions, bad feelings, and bad opinions. We don't want those. 
We want people to have no reaction. If we get people to have no reaction, we gradually move it on and move it closer and closer and closer until it's a non-event when they see a gun. And that's what we want. And you also want to avoid open carrying when you're doing anything where you seek out someone for an encounter. Now, if your neighbor's dog is coming into your yard and relieving themselves, leaving a pile of warm, steamy mess behind or whatever, and you're going to go confront your neighbor, don't open carry, okay? Maybe maybe your neighbor's a, a professional kickboxer and you're afraid he's going to kill you when you do this and you don't want to be unarmed. Well, conceal carry, but go see your neighbor, negotiate with him, remain level-headed, and do not open carry. Because when you confront him and there's any kind of a confrontation and you have a weapon, it becomes a problem. He may call the police, say, well, my neighbor came over here and he had a gun and he was pretty threatening to me, all because my dog uh, didn't have time to get back in my yard before he took a dump. No, that's not what happened, but it's his word against your word and he called the police and got his story to him first. You probably don't even think about it. This is why you want to conceal carry when you're confronting your neighbor over their dog. I recommend avoiding open carry when you go into some place to pay bills. Anytime you're seeking somebody out to confront them, whether it's to give them money because you owe them or to get them to, uh, to get them to control something or behave themselves or something like that. Anything where somebody might feel like you're not happy because you're doing this, don't open carry. For the same reasons you want to avoid carrying around schools, parks, playgrounds, and youth centers. You're going to generate these negative emotions, these negative feelings, and these negative opinions. And then we have to acclimate people even more before we normalize open carry with them. Now, when you open carry, there's a few things that you can do to make it less alarming and more normal for people. You can dress professionally. You can act professionally. You can go out of your way and be nice and do things like hold doors open or open doors for people. You can help someone needing something off the top shelf of the store. In all honesty, what you want to do is you want to be nice, you want to be helpful, you want to be courteous, and more importantly than that, you want to be friendly. Always appear happy, always appear relaxed, and more than anything, appear as normal as you can. And when you're open carrying, please, do not draw attention to the weapon. In fact, draw attention away from the weapon. Make people remember you and not the weapon. Now you may say, well, why do we want to, how are we going to normalize open care if people don't remember the weapon? Because people are going to remember you. They're going to remember you had that gun, but they're going to remember you. They're going to remember you were nice, you were friendly, you helped them, and they're going to remember that they like you. So what if you got a gun? Who cares? They like you. They trust you. You're a good guy. They don't have a problem with you having a gun. Now, let's say there's 10 people that that, that they feel that way about. And these 10 people are people they encounter throughout their lives on a regular basis. Or maybe they just encounter you off the cuff of the, you know, just a one-time encounter. The next guy that comes along is going to have an easier time generating the positive feelings, the positive emotions, and the positive opinions for gun owners than you did. You'll have an easier time because they won't, they will think back to you and they will remember those positive emotions, those positive feelings, and those positive opinions they had. And when they do, he gets a little bit of credit because of your work. You get credit because of the last guy's work. It makes it easier for all of us, and soon we're all getting credit for everybody's work because that's what a community does. Hey, you know what? We've had enough fun on this one. Before I hit the audio that tells you how to get in touch with me, let me say that when I went to Midland and I got the STI, I left Seagraves. I stopped at the bank. My bank has a 30 7 sign, but they support concealed carry, so I concealed carry it into the bank. I took care of my business there. While I was in Seagraves, I... or. But before I got to the bank, but and while I was in Seagraves, I had to do a few errands, and I open carried for those. I let me think here. I had to run to the barber shop for something other than a haircut, and I open carried there. I had a conversation over the pistol and open carry. That was a nice one. I pumped gas in my pickup. The machine didn't give me a receipt, so I had to go in and I had to get a receipt. That was okay. Then I left Seagraves. I got what I needed. I went to the bank. After I left Seagraves, I dropped in on the bank because the bank I was using in this case is an out-of-town bank. Once I got there or got that done, I moved on to 
I went from the, uh, I went on to Midland. I went into the store and they sell firearms and firearm related accessories. I was open carrying there. Then I went and I, let's see, what else did I do? After I left there, I went to the indoor range. After I left there, I went to a fast food joint and grabbed, grabbed a meal and I open carried in there. I'm not going to name the place, but everything was nice. Everything was professional. I encountered a few officers. Nobody said a word. I greeted people. They greeted, they returned the greetings. Everything was normal. I went from there. Let's see what, oh, after I, after I left the indoor range, I had to run by a branch of one of my banks that's in Midland. And again, this is the same branch of the, of, I mean, this is a branch of the same bank that had the 30 out seven sign, but they do allow concealed carry. And I may just go get a picture of their door sometime because it's, it's something that I feel people need to know about. They treat it as a dress code, and I don't blame them. This is what they want. I don't hold it against them. I feel in time we can convert them over. If they threw up a 30 out 6 sign, well, I'd be changing banks in their case. But I had to go back to the bank, get money, go back to the indoor range, get the gun, and then I went and ate. I open carried there. So except for the two times I went in the bank, I open carried that whole day. As I'm coming home, I have to go to Seminole. I had to pass through it anyway. So I drop in, see my buddy Ray. I'm open carrying while I'm at his employer. Everybody that works with him carries a, or owns a gun. I know at least one other guy has or has had a license to carry. I don't know if he does. I don't pay attention. I know him. He's a non-threat. He's a good guy. I don't pay attention to his weapon. But I open carried that whole day, and nobody said a word. Nobody did anything. Nobody acted unusual. All because... I was doing what I did here. When I was going back to the gun counter, I had a lady, uh, well, not the gun counter, but the, in the store where I had to get some stuff that was firearms related. I guess you could say it was a gun counter. When I was going back there, I was walking past a lady and she was having trouble getting, it wasn't off the top shelf, but it was something pretty high up and she was having trouble reaching all the way to, to the back of the shelf to get it. And I offered to help her and I did. Everything that I have mentioned here, I do. I do not open carry when I'm going to go seek out someone for an encounter. I'm not, I'm not going to open carry around a school or a park or a playground or a youth center. I don't want to open carry around crowds just because I don't like being around crowds, but still. But everything I said to do here, I did. Everything I said not to do, I didn't do. And I had nothing negative happen. Nobody called the police on me. Everything was normal and everything was good. With that said, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me, and then we'll hit the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 292 67 Okay, we're back. You know, in my show notes, I'm going to throw in a link to the family indoor range and or family armory and indoor range. While that was playing, I looked them up. I'm going to throw in a link to their website. Now, when I went into their website, they did not know I was a podcaster. I actually left them a review on Facebook. They had no reason to give me any kind of a discount or anything like that. I wanted to get that out of the way. I experienced this just like any other customer. I don't think they would have done it anyway because who gives podcasters discounts? Anybody can become a podcaster, so I don't recommend podcasting as a means to get a discount. However, I do recommend podcasting as a way to promote somebody or to say attaboy or basically to get a message out. I do recommend giving people credit when credit's due. And I cannot, I cannot stress enough how clean, how professional, and how great an experience it was at this indoor range. Now, with that said, let's move on to the news. We have two stories in the legal considerations category, and I'm recording this on Friday. We'll release this late Monday night, early Tuesday morning, something like that. In legal considerations, a Texas man recently learned the value of on-body carry when his weapon fell out of his vehicle and resulted in him being arrested while on what appears to be false charges. The arresting officer claims the man pointed his gun at him twice, 
which is denied by the man that was arrested, obviously. Additionally, the off-duty officer was buying alcoholic beverages while he was in uniform, and according to the article, that's a violation of his department's policy. Already, if I was a juror, I'd be saying, you know what, this officer doesn't seem like he was quite on the level before he had this encounter. I'm not going to be all that inclined to believe he's on the level during the encounter either. So if they decide to prosecute this man, I think the prosecutor's got an uphill battle. Because if I was a juror and I became aware that the officer was involved in violating his department's policy before the case, the events in the case, or immediately before it, well, I think it might color the officer's activity or the behavior during the encounter. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of having the whole picture. And I'll throw a link to all these stories with uh, in the show notes. Now, if you haven't heard about the shooting at the Lackland Air Force Base, well, I think that happened two weeks ago. But the gunman in the shooting is a former FBI agent, or, or a former FBI agent, and officials are currently investigating a number of facts, including whether or not the shooter was authorized to have a weapon on base. Apparently, there's some confusion about this. But this story only goes to show that gun control is a fallacy because, as an FBI agent, the op, uh, the shooter was authorized to carry a weapon. And because he's military, at some point, he's authorized to carry a weapon. Maybe not inside the United States. Maybe it's only when he would be deployed or would have been deployed. But in all honesty, I'm going to say that there's something there's something to learn from this. And that is you cannot count on the government to protect you. In fact, the employees of the government may be the ones that try to hurt you. Counties and other bodies across the state are now deciding if they wish to fight the Attorney General who has issued a number of letters regarding the wrongful exclusion of license holders. Now, just between me and the world, this is something that's happening across the state, and it's a good thing. Now, this article, it mainly addresses Dallas County and their firearms ban, but like I said, this is happening across the state, and it's something that if you encounter one of these signs and you don't think it's legal for them to post it at a, on, the, on a government body's uh, building or a property or something like that, go through the process, file the report, and see if the AG's office makes it disappear. Moving on, more colleges and universities are progressing with their campus carry rules. I've seen like three or four that have actually popped up in my news feed recently. And the article I'm going to link to deals with the a and University, which they're going to permit firearms in classrooms and dorms. However, their policy does allow staff to request that their offices be placed off limits. Now, we do have another story where the media has once again discovered that states with non-resident license, in many cases, have a license that will work in Texas and that Texans are going and getting those licenses for various reasons. The article does point out that Virginia, unlike Texas, does not protect the identities of license holders. And the article also points out that Senator Whitmire, and I believe he's a Democrat and I want to say he's very low rated by the TSRA, I'd have to look and I may be wrong. I seem to remember Senator Whitmire being involved in gun control, but the article points out that Senator Whitmire has intentions of changing the reciprocity system if the legislature will work with him. Now, personally, I think the reciprocity system we have works very well, and the only change I would make is I would recognize licenses from all states, and I would codify that. It would just be, if you have a license from any state in the union, we recognize it. That would be my change. Moving on, guns and ranges is our next category. And this is one from, it's not from Midland. It's just a few miles west of Midland, and it's a city of Odessa. Precision Syndicate from Odessa, Texas generated quite a bit of controversy. And if you haven't seen this already, well, I'd like to know what rock you're living under. You see, the controversy they generated, they generated it when they customized a Glock with the paint scheme and logo from a 1980s Nintendo accessory called the Nintendo Zapper. The Glock in question is reportedly a one-off job and is an example of the custom work they do. I've never been in their facility. I've never talked to anyone from there. They're in my backyard. You'd be amazed at how many how many custom gun shops we have in the area. I don't have any in my hometown, but we have a lot in the area. I have a couple of guys from my hometown that do custom gun work, 
but none of these guys are in my area or none of, none of them are in my hometown. I can drive three hours and have my choice of custom gun work. You know what? Let's end the news with a defensive gun use story. An armed man came to the aid of a young girl and her family when the girl escaped from an armed home invader and then went for help. The armed citizen went to his home, retrieved his weapon, and then drove the suspect off. Police found the suspect who was arrested and property from the scene was recovered. Folks, I can't stress it enough. If you have to go get your gun, you may not be able to get it when you need it the most. I'm just saying. You know what? Going back through all of our news stories and thinking about this, one of these stories gave me an idea for what will probably be the topic of another episode, or the next episode. You may be wondering, what story is that? Well, the non-resident licenses that work in Texas, why do we fight to keep that? Why do we fight to let people carry on a Florida license or, or uh, a Virginia license or anything like that? Why do we let people, why do we fight to let people have a license? from another state and let them use it in Texas if they live in Texas. I think we need to address that in an episode, and I think that will be episode 86 that we address that in. But hey, for now, I'm going to sign this thing off, so please stay safe, carry responsibly, and more, more importantly, go to the range and get that practice in. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.